So let me start off with history repeating itself. And it's going to be a little history lesson, OK? So looking at some of the, the dates and seeing why are they important. Uh, 2700 BC, here, chew this plant. OK, that's back when is sort of when they said that that's where cannabis was being used back then. 1851, the plant is heathen. Here, say this prayer. 1936. What happened in 1936? Is prayer is superstitious? Here, drink this potion. Anybody know in relationship to cannabis, what happened in 1936? Huh? Mm, close. I think it was before. I think prohibition was a little before that. But you know, something I've been. I, I actually saw the movie twice over the last few weeks. I can't believe it. I, I shut it off because it's too much. But reefer madness. Anybody? <laughs> Okay, that's what it, it, at that time, they were trying to show the country that cannabis was dangerous because they were making women too sexy and too sexual, making men too much where they're groping over women, and you're going to lose your children. So you should watch it. It's actually out there. You're on, it, you're reef of Madness. 1937, potion is snake oil. Here, rub this cream. What happened in 1937? There was a tax act, the Marijuana Tax Act. Actually, marijuana was spelled not with a J, but an H. And it was a tax act. And what they did was they decided to tax anyone who bought cannabis, sold cannabis, doctors who were recommending cannabis, a tax. This is the start of the end of cannabis, because before then, people were using it. You know. So, wh so what, what was the tax? Does anybody know how much? One dollar was the tax. What was the penalty if you were caught? Five years, up to five years imprisonment. Okay. 1964, cream is ineffective. Take this antibiotic. All right, I'm, you know what the question is, right? Mazulam in Israel actually first identified THC. 1972, oh, let me go back to that tax act. The Marijuana Tax Act. Um, it was revoked, actually, in 1969. And then in 1970, they repealed it, and they developed what's known as the Controlled Substance Act, when they started to using the scheduling of drugs, and cannabis was listed as a Schedule I, along with heroin. So eat this cheese, I put that in there, 1972. What was that about? Well. Um, there was a Schaefer Commission that was developed by Richard Nixon, and he wanted to ask this commission, it was, it was run by Mr. Schaefer, I don't know if it's a doctor, but it's Mr. Schaefer, and his group to evaluate cannabis and to see if it's safe. In the end, Nixon said, I don't care if it's safe, I'm still not going to approve it. It was deemed it's safe enough, but it didn't matter. So cheese. Richard Nixon, his favorite food, cottage cheese with ketchup on top. Okay. 2014, here, vape this plant. Vape was the number one, the new word in the Oxford Dictionary in, 19, in 2014. And all right, let's talk about it. So this just shows you, and this was Sir William Osler, who's very well known as almost the father of medicine. And this was a, there was a statement by the president of the New York Neurological Society that recommended cannabis for migraine. And what he noted was that it's the mo that cannabis is the most satisfactory remedy, recommends long dosing regimen. I don't know what that means, but um, just so you know, it is not approved for headache or migraine. Here just shows you across the country, you know, the, the green represents the ones that are legalized for recre adult recreational and medical use. Then it goes down, you can see the legalized for medical use only, the orange is sort of expected to legalize and what's illegal. In New York, it is recommended medically. There are certain conditions medically. And what they came up with, cancer, HIV and AIDS, epilepsy, neuropathies, ALS, Huntington disease, Parkinson's, MS, inflammatory bowel, damage to the spinal cord. So damage to the spinal cord, which could be a possibility with syringomyelia or something like that could be. But in March of 2017, 
It was now approved for chronic pain. So what is the definition of chronic pain? Three months of pain, and you have had to have failed a treatment. They don't tell you what treatment, but in essence, when you speak to some of the attorneys that I've spoken to at our society, any treatment. Doesn't tell you what. So almost, and I'm making it up, but almost ask you to walk two steps, come back, it didn't work, okay. You know, that could be a treatment. I'm not saying that is the treatment, but, and, and again, I make light of it, but it's serious in the sense that you, every chronic pain patient should not be on cannabis. And it should be that there's other trials first. It shouldn't be the, the only trial, the first trial. It is something, we'll talk about how it may work and how it could be beneficial, but it shouldn't be that now putting everybody on cannabis because then it'll become its own epidemic and a problem. And here just shows you the cannabis plant. And it looks at, if you look at the top here, you know, you have the leaf. And this is the sativa and the indica. Okay, the, this comes from the sativa tree, right? That is basically a very tall tree, smaller leaves. And the, the indica is more of a stubbier, shorter tree. Um, and it shows you that you can also combine them now. So it's not simply sativa and indica. It's almost there's a lot of hybrids. I don't know if any of you have gone to a dispensary. It's an experience. Uh, you can't go in New York in a dispensary. I can't even go in. Um, you have to be a patient that's certified. But for the recreational side, like in Colorado, it's quite interesting. It is quite interesting, and it's an education in itself. You can go on the recreational side. And they are quite educated. They're the people that educate you, that are behind the, 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 the table, that you know, they have all their products. They're known as bud tenders. Not bartenders, bud tenders. Okay, so you know we talk about this this plant and that there's a lot of you know we talk about the cannabinoids THC and we'll talk about that in CBD, but there are hundreds of these. So it's not just that, but these are the ones that are primarily the components now that we see. The terpene component that's what's thought to be responsible for the scent of the cannabis plant, and it goes down what other ingredients are in that in the cannabis plant. So. Tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, it is the principal psychoactive compound. It works on these CB1 and CB2 receptors. We'll touch upon that a little later. Its main metabolite, which is what you'll see in the urine screen, is 11-hydroxy-THC. It is more psychoactive than actually THC itself. But it does have medicinal effects. We forget, you know, we think, okay, it's, only, it's the thing that gets you high. Okay, it could. But it also has analgesic effects. And it also has been shown to be somewhat neuroprotective. Cannabidiol, the CBD, this is where that CBD oil, and this is something that you see in epilepsy too, there's some that are just CBD that uh, can maybe potentially control seizures. There's no psychoactive effect. It doesn't work that much on these CB receptors, but works on 5-HT receptors, serotonin receptors, which is thought to be responsible for anxiety, thought to be responsible for pain. And so it does have good analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and also anti-emetic effects to prevent vomiting. And it's also been shown that it, in, it inhibits the release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines that actually can promote pain. So it's sort of this yin-yang type theory. The yin is THC, right? And the yin is, if you look at yin, it's, it's you know, yin and yang. Everyone knows it's actually probably reversed in this sense, because the yin is considered the quiet, subdued person, and the yang is considered the hyper. So THC induces anxiety. It has psychotic-like effects. It impairs memory, potentially, and learning, and tachycardia. If you look at CBD, it has an opposite effect. What's nice, though, what you, what's very important to note is the last thing, is that it actually works together with THC to provide the benefit of THC without the psychoactive component. So the two together actually work very well. So you get the CBD that works on its own, but also has an effect on the THC that works so that you don't get that inducement of that, that psychotic effect from it. So that's why they'll, they'll talk about this when you, if you ever take it or if you have patients who are taking it, that you'll see a component, THC, CBD, and there's ratios. So, Let's just talk about this system. You know, we talk about the, 
endorphins, right? The endorphins, the run is high. Well, it's thought that there's also the endocannabinoids. And it's thought that maybe that the run is high is not solely based on endorphins, but it may be based also on endocannabinoids that are triggered once there is that, that movement and that running that you're having. This system can be affected by many different things. Stress can definitely induce this endocannabinoid system. So is everybody ready for this slide? I'm not. OK. So I'm not, so don't worry. So the thing is, is that it was just sort of a segue. The endocannabinoid system, it's made up of the receptors, the endogenous component, and the degradative enzymes. That's known as the endocannabinoid system. This system is not, it's waiting to work. It's not working, in a sense, or if it is working, it's at a low end. It's only working when there's a stressor, a trigger, that triggers this system to become activated. And it works very quickly, and it gets degraded very quickly. So the, these receptors, the CB1 receptors, and they're located in the brain. They're located in the fat tissue, muscle, liver, GI tract, and pancreas. And we'll talk about it primarily in brain. The CB2 receptors are more in the immune system. The endogenous ligands, which are known as amandamide. Anyone know what that means, ananda? The word means bliss or joy. That's where it came from, anandamide. Or 2-arachidonyl glycerol. These are the two basic, there are probably others, but endogenous um, ligands. And again, they're activated upon demand. When it's needed, they get activated, and then they're degraded, and it's gone. This was something that I think is very interesting by Ethan Russo, who looked at this about maybe patients who are suffering with pain have this deficiency of the endocannabinoid system, that it's not working. And he looked at it in theories of migraine, fibromyalgia, IBS, and treatment-resistant syndromes, that there may be a deficiency in these patients, and that's what we've got to look at. So this is just a cartoon looking at the distribution of CB1 receptors in the brain. And you can tell there a lot, right? There's a lot. If you look at it, this is in a, I'm not sure what animal I'm forgetting now, is a mouse or it's a rat. But here's a picture looking at the mu receptors and the CB1 receptors. There are actually more CB receptors in the brain then there are mu receptors in the brain. Very important. What's also nice to see is that they co-localize. Right? So if you look at this diamond, right, that's a mu receptor. If you look at this, all this, all this around it is actually the CB1 receptors. Look how many, there's so much more CB1 receptors even compared to mu receptors. But they are together, and it may be that they actually work better together. And so, you know, a lot of times we try to say, okay, let's, maybe the theory has been that if we get people on cannabis, we can get them off the opiate. And that may be true, but it also may be true that it actually may make the opiate work better. So there may be a working together relationship there. One of the things about the mu, the mu receptor compared to the CB1 receptor is one thing. The mu receptors, they're located in the brainstem. The cannabis, the CB1 receptors are not. Why is that important? because you don't get respiratory depression with cannabis. You can get it with opiates. That's very important. And it just talks about it here, that there are these endogenous neuromodulators. They work in the peripheral nociceptive system. They work in the sensory neuron system, the descending system, and they're not in the brainstem. So that's a very important point. This is not my dog, but, and he's not on cannabis, or maybe, I don't know. But the thing is, is that the cannabis effects it depends on the product, the duration, how long it's being used, the dosage formulation. We'll go over some of these. Root administration, the kinetics, drug interactions. And here just shows you the raw materials. You know, if you have you know, marijuana, it's up to 20% THC. If you have, what they do is this thing called butter. You know, I got to see this and touch this in a sense, butter. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it looks like peanut butter, you know, but they call it butter. And they remove the terpenes so there's no scent to it. And it has a concentrate of about 40 to 80% of THC. And hashish is a little bit low, you know, lower, about up to 20%. And then you have the cannabidiol oil, which is essentially the CBD. So root of administration. Well, we could, right? You could smoke it. All right, typical joint, 0.5 to 0.8 grams of cannabis. 8% of it is THC in general. 
This is the problem, though. 20 to 70 percent reach the lung, and the bioavailability is only about 20 to 37 percent. It works immediately. It's cleared within three hours. The psycho effect, psychoactive effect, is about a minute and a half, and it can last up to one to four hours. And it heats the cannabis, the smoking of it, to the combustion point. That's the point where you can start having problems with lung tissue, risk of lung cancer. So smoking weed is not good for the lung, OK? Even though cannabis has been shown to be anti-tumor, all right? But if you're smoking it, it could potentially cause a problem. Vape, which I wasn't aware of this, but it's been around since the 70s, the vape. And its onset is also immediate, same bioavailability. The thing is, it doesn't heat up to the combustion level. So it's safer in regards to lung tissue. Then that's an important part. Lung cancer is a lower risk versus smoking. The downside is it's a higher cost. If you want to purchase one, and again, you go into the store, it's like going into a candy store, and you know, you can get the $50 model, which really doesn't work, or the $100 model, or the $200 model, you get the Cadillac of 700, you know, so you can, there's a wide range of what you can get um, with, this, with the vape. And you put the oil in, and, you've, and it's vaporized. Edibles, uh, these are not available in New York. They are available in Colorado. Um, and they'll have different flavors to it. You know, this is the blueberry flavor. This is, you know, like if you go and get chocolate, you know, you want to get dark chocolate, right? Well, you can get the same thing with cannabis in it. You know, and they have similar names to it. It's so you can see you have Baby Jane, butter, finger, you know, I mean, so they, they have all these things. The peak concentration is up to six hours. 50% metabolizes to the metabolite, which again is psychoactive, but it takes a very long time. So it's not a, it's not a delivery system good for acute pain. Uh, it's more attractive to kids. Look at, you know, you look at this and go, oh, look at this. I got, you know, butterfinger, let me get one. Uh, so it's not always good. And the evidence still clinically is not great with this route of administration. This is where the cannabinoid medications have been licensed, Sativex. People, how many of you have used or prescribed Marinol? It's used a lot of times for, for nausea. It doesn't really work well for pain, and probably part of the reason is, is that there's no CBD component. It's solely THC. Epidolax, which has been really studied now with epilepsy, and it has shown benefit. Topically, you can also put it on topically. Uh, the onset is not really clear, but maybe one or two hours. It's questionable about its bioavailability. But it is used, and it is the, out there. Um, it is there in states that allow this formulation. OK, so we're just going to talk a little bit about study. It says here, more senior citizens using pot. Really feeling my joints today. She goes, yeah, me too. OK. <laughs> so cannabis research challenges. What is the number one challenge? It's a scheduled one drug. We got approval to do a study. And the study was to look at opiates and look at you know, cannabis and see how we can reduce the opioid consumption in patients with chronic pain. Hospital loved the idea. We got it. We said, we're in. We're going to get it. Send it to the state. It was almost an automatic. We didn't get it. So there's an issue still because it's a Schedule One drug. It is still an illegal drug. And how do you study it if it's an illegal drug? That's still the problem. Not enough randomized trials, poor study design, small and short duration, a lot of these different features. And a lot of the research was basically with a lot of THC, not CBD. So you want to go over some of the peer-reviewed articles? There are peer-reviewed articles with cannabis for chronic pain and for other conditions as well. So they're out there. It's not that there aren't there. It's just that a lot of them are not in the states. A lot of them are in other countries that, um, that are, you know, are more open to the idea. And what, this is something that, talking about chronic pain, this was something Vargas and his colleagues in 2010, this is from Canada. And what happens, we often have used this in chronic pain, is that there's a step ladder. Step one, two, three, mild, moderate, and severe. Mild meant anti-inflammatories, moderate meant anti-inflammatories and maybe a little bit of, you know, tonalcodine or something like that, a mild opiate. And then step three was high dose opiates. Well, what they looked at and said, you know, cannabis could be beneficial in all of these steps. 
So he brought that out, or that it was brought out there. And, and again, it's something I think is very important that it could be beneficial, and it could be a complementary treatment, or it could be a, a treatment alone. We do have patients who have reduced their opioid consumption with cannabis. This just shows you, the, the, these are at least five, but these are the, uh, good quality studies looking at it for pain with cannabis. If you look at it, it's all neuropathy. So before chronic pain was actually um, you know, a sort of um, allowed or approved, it was neuropathy. You had to have sort of a peripheral neuropathy. And here are five studies that show there is good evidence that it is beneficial for neuropathy. Various types, HIV neuropathy, sensory neuropathy, simply neuropathic pain, diabetic neuropathy. And here shows you also that these reviews, I mean, it, it's out there. It's not like we're dealing with this is all just recreational and there's no studies and people just want to get high and they feel good and therefore their pain is better. It clearly has been studied. It's been studied in chronic pain, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, central pain in MS. Not central pain in Chiari or syringomyelia, but it has been showed. And you know, so what has also been showed which is very important, is that people use less opiates while on cannabis. So some people say, you know, you're just switching one with the other. You know, you're doing the cannabis, okay, now you're on opiates, you know, now you're on cannabis, so, you know, which is the worst of two evils or which is the lesser of two evils? And the thing is, is that the evidence shows that cannabis does work, there's a mechanism for it, there are CB receptors in the brain, therefore it is, there is some reason for why it's working, not just simply based on getting high, and it may have less side effects. And here just shows you, this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis of cannabis for medical use. And what they showed, and this was I think 2015, that there was a mo moderate quality, which is quite good when you have a drug that's not, that's considered a Schedule I illegal drug, it's still, there's evidence out there that shows moderate quality evidence for chronic pain. But there are precautions. It's not simply, okay, because it's a plant, because it's a flower, because whatever it is, it's natural. What I try to tell patients, an earthquake is natural too. You know, there's side effects to it. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it doesn't have side effects. It is well tolerated. There are some risks of cardiovascular events with it. Tachycardia is one of the side effects that you could get. And that probably is with the THC component. The thing is, is that because it can affect executive functioning and, co you know, there, there's some risk in cognition, um, it's not recommended in, in um, someone who's pregnant because fetal exposure, there may be a potential risk. Again, the data is small, but there's still a risk. So if someone's pregnant, they shouldn't um, be, be using it. Um, if adolescents, it's still, they, they recommend it should be avoided. Now, there is, some, there is some in some camps that say, no, it shouldn't be, it should be fine. But there's still not enough evidence, and there may be because the brain is still developing in adolescence, it should not be recommended. Um, there is some issue with driving, you know, and the, the question is, is that is, should there be an, you know, a sort of a, a risk there that's noted that, look, you can't drive? You know, people drink too and, and drive, and that's not allowed, but it's a lot less than what's been reported with cannabis compared to alcohol. I generally tell patients that, look, you, you should not be you know, using your vape while driving. And you should not, if you feel, because it's just like taking an opiate, if you feel that you're not feeling right, or someone is noting that you're not feeling right, or you're feeling lightheaded, you should not drive. So often there should be a duration of time that we'll give them and say, look, give it a few hours before you go ahead and drive. And they're pretty much okay with that in that sense. Um, the cannabis should be avoided in patients who are at risk for psychosis, an obvious thing. And there are drug interactions, so just to be aware, there's a whole slew of them because there are different metabolites and there are different, um, how it, the metabolic pathway that may have a drug-drug interaction with other agents. You saw this slide again. We talk about cannabis as zero. There are no overdose death rates in America related to cannabis directly from cannabis. And this just shows you the diversity of opinions. And this, was, um, this is a great article if you want to read it in the Journal of Pain in, last year, looking at the pro and the con. The pro is, this is an old thing. This has been around for 2,000, 3,000 years being used. What's the big deal? It's, a, you know, it's safe. Using the whole plant 
not just using cannabis as a drug has been shown to be better. And that's always the issue with herbs and everything. We want to select out what's the active ingredient, but what's been shown is that you want to use the entire plant, not just use a selective component to it. It has a low risk for overdose and addiction. It reduces opioid-related harm, so there is a reduction in the use of opiates with cannabis, and it's inexpensive to grow and to produce. It's not inexpensive to purchase. That's the big issue. Insurance companies, because it is not a legal drug, will not help you. There are some cases where they have given some compassionate money or something directed towards it, but in general, it has to be out of pocket. And so what ends up happening is you give enough that they could pay for, which is not what you do when you give a drug, right? You say, I'm going to give you this amount because this is what I think is going to work. You almost have to give it dependent on how much they can pay for it. And you give a letter of recommendation to the patient, to the, they then bring it to the dispensary. The dispensary, has, the dispensary should be run by a physician and a pharmacist. So there is, you know, there's some definite medical background there. And that they have sort of a little wiggle room where they can sort of change around a little bit. So you're giving a letter of recommendation. You're not giving a specific prescription. What's the con? The dosing and predictability. And again, the studies aren't enough out there to, to show what's the right dose. The dosing is being used based on the individual patient, not based on the data. Um, and the thing, the fear is, OK, now you're going to use it recreationally. It's going to be out there. And you know, I, uh, how many of you have been to Colorado recently? They're out there. There's a lot of people out there smoking and using it. And it's, sometimes it's a little questionable when you're on the street and you, you know, you're smelling it everywhere you go. So you know, there is a question there. So there is that concept, is this now going to be liberalized and everyone's going to use it and it's going to be out there and people are going to be you know, sort of high um, with this. We're talking specifically about medical cannabis, not recreational cannabis. And smoking the cannabis obviously can be, can be harmful. Not, not vaping that has less uh, negative effect. So the big question is research. And until it gets taken off that schedule, there's still going to be a problem with research because it is a Schedule One drug listed at heroin. We can't study heroin, so we can't study cannabis. And if you look at the history of why this drug was put on Schedule One, there is absolutely no good reason. So. That's where I'm at with cannabis. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. We have a few questions. Uh, a little bit lingering from the morning session, but uh, okay. they're all very interesting. What's the difference between oxycodone and hydrocodone? Well, hydrocodone is hydrocodone, and oxycodone is an oxy <laughs> derivative of it. It's thought that oxycodone, even though in general when you look at the equivalency, they're essentially the same, oxycodone may be a little bit more potent than the hydrocodone. And oxycodone is what you see in Percocet and Oxycontin. Hydrocodone is what you see in Vicodin. Uh, I, I understood that there are a few patients that have more uh, nausea from one than the other, and maybe switching is some advantage, and why? was hydrocodone always compounded with, uh, uh, with uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen were, I mean, it occurs with oxycodone, but there was a time when you couldn't get hydrocodone by itself. It was always compounded with. Uh, right, it was always right. I, well, the thing is, is that, you know, first of all, Tylenol codeine was actually, codeine was the first, right? And so codeine became such, what happened was, is that there was a lot of constipation with codeine that was found. And so then they became, they developed these semi synthetic and synthetic agents and um, hydrocodone was put together with um, acetaminophen, and it was scheduled lower. So it's scheduled three, not a scheduled two. And so what did that mean? What difference is that? Well, with hydrocodone, you can get, with Vicodin, you can get refills. You can get five months supply, you know, six months supply with that, because it was a schedule three. There was a less risk. And it may have been based on the fact that because it was combined with, you know, acetaminophen. Um, then what happened was is that so oxycodone is a Schedule II, and that is a big, big difference. Hydrocodone now is does have a pure formulation as alone. There is there is an agent that's an extended release pure hydrocodone. 
Um, but I think the, and I don't know the definitive answer, but I, I would surmise that it probably was, they, they combined it with acetaminophen and it became a less, you know, it was listed as a Schedule three. It is now considered a Schedule two drug, but it was considered at one time a Schedule three drug, which was probably more, you know, more docs would prescribe it and it got to be more of a problematic drug because it was easy to refill and what happens is a lot of times, you know, you write for five refills and it's a 30 day supply and meanwhile patients will go to the pharmacist and get it in two weeks and get another refill and then get another refill and the time wasn't really fully a 30 day supply. Okay, uh, is there a preferred method for getting someone off opioids that's been on them for years? Slowly. Um, the thing is, is that we've had patients and I could count them on two hands. I wouldn't say it's that many patients, but we've had some patients that just stopped. And they were on, I, you know, they could be on 50 or 100 milligrams of morphine, and they just said, yeah, I, I decided to stop. I don't want this anymore. And no side effect, no withdrawal. I'm like, I couldn't believe it. But generally, the recommendation to decrease is that you, do, you can do between 10 and 25% of the drug per month. You know, so... You know, sometimes, and then it gets to be, you know, the amount that you're on, just decrease it by 10 or 25%. We try to tell the patients, look, you may not feel the best during this time, you know, but many patients we have seen, and it's been documented in literature, actually feel better off the medication, that they're all of a sudden clearer. Their pain isn't increased enough to make a big difference, but they're so frightened of it and I can understand that you're on something for a long time. You're so dependent. You're not addicted. You're dependent. And getting off it is, you know, sometimes we'll say, you know, I have a patient now that I'm trying to get down. And he's, he calls me probably once a week. I see him once a month. Doc, can you just, just try to do it a little slower? Can you just try to do it a little slower? And it's like 5% or 10%. And we're trying very slow, and so because it's an individual patient, as long as we're going in the right direction, we're fine. So that's the recommendation between 10 to 25 percent per month. Um, if it's an you know, some people say, well, can I come off the extended release or the short acting first? It's debatable which one you want to come off first. Um, I often will say, let's keep the short acting around more because it gives you a sense of if I need it, I can take it. So the extended release. Is something where you know you're 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 coming down, that's okay. But if you're just kept on that and you have pain now, you don't have that immediate release, that one that you can take, then you may have a more difficult time. So we try to keep the the short acting around more before we get off that, as opposed to the extended release. What about the issues of uh, tolerance and physical dependence on uh, uh, cannabis? You know, that, that's the thing. I, you know, I, they, they say that it, sh it shouldn't be or that there's a... I, look, you know, the thing is you, you learn enough in history. If you look back in, in the 1901 or 1903, you know, where was heroin at that time? Heroin was considered the non-addictive drug that was going to be used in patients who were having problem with morphine. Um, the, the heroin came out... Um, because of that, and because it was a big heroin epidemic, a big morphine or opiate epidemic at that time, and there was also TB, and so it was a big cough and TB problem, so they needed a drug, so heroin was there. And bare aspirin had the rights to it, and if you ever look online, you can see bare aspirin has the same on a poster, aspirin and heroin, that they were advertising. So, you know, I think, we, I don't think we know the numbers, but I think there's going to be a dependency because people get dependent on it. I mean, you get dependent on ice cream, you know, I mean, <laughs> you get dependent on anything. Um, so I think, you know, there is, a, there is definitely a, a risk of dependency. And tolerance, there's some debate about that, too, that people thinking that it may, it's a lower chance of that. But again, history tells you, don't always say, oh, this is the panacea. This may also, in time, you may develop a tolerance, but I don't think we know the numbers yet. Uh, what about effects uh, on libido and fertility? And there's some question long-term use in men that they had decreased libido, testicular atrophy, and things like that. Is with there, opiates, I know. With op what about with cannabis? There, there is, there, you know, there, there is some evidence, there's some in the literature about that, but it's more with opiates, that they actually can get lower testosterone levels, we had a patient who sort of 
transformed into, I, I, it's, I'm exaggerating, into a woman like in the, on opiates. Um, and we checked his pituitary and his evidence to show that it does affect that whole pathway in testosterone. He, he all of a sudden developed breasts. He, he lost hair on his face. Um, he became more rounded, not to say that that's a woman compared to a man, but he became more, and he said, I'm like, a, it's like, I don't know what's going on, my genitalia, everything, we got him off the opiates and everything sort of returned. And there's evidence in the literature about opiates, with cannabis is not so clear, but there's some evidence of that, but I think more with opiates, that is a, there, and again, it's a small risk, but it's something to be aware of that, you know, it's not just a benign drug. Uh, just a question about the specifics of uh, prescribing. Now, physicians in New York State, for instance, they can take a course and then be able to prescribe. Right. Right. And that course is what about two hundred fifty dollars or something like that. It's a it's a state it's, run. Yeah. It's I think it's four. It's yeah two hundred fifty dollars. It's a it's a three to four hour course online. Um, it's very basic. Um, very basic. We've talked to the people at the state level and which was very we were very pleased they actually asked us to be part of helping them to educate physicians because it's you know they're in the legal end and they're on the administrative end so what you know they, they have limited evidence and limited knowledge in this area but it's a very simple test you have to take the test and it's like I said it's very straightforward it talks a little bit about receptors and talks a little bit about but it's very straightforward um, it's like a three-hour test. Um, I think they actually list it as a four-hour, but it's a three-hour test. And, our and, and then you, you have to then go the next step to actually get the authorization to actually recommend it. And, so, and then the patient also has to get a, a card from the state that well, allows... Who generates that thing? Then? So as a physician, you take the... You take it and you get you get and that you have patient to get a has separate to go to certification. The state. No, you have to get a separate certification uh, in addition to taking the course, or no? It's it's to, you t you could take the course and you could stop there, but then there's an extended level where you get now to take the, to actually be able to certify. It's part and of the same. What do they prescribe? Do they can they prescribe different uh, combinations of yes. THC and you can com you can you can do different uh, ratios of the THC. So you can do. The, the recommendation now in, in, with the dispensaries and with, with physicians that you can do, you know, THC, CBD one-to-one. -one. You can do is a one-to-one -one ratio, and then you could do it as a high THC level compared to a CBD, and you could do the reverse. The, why is that? I mean, why would you even, you know? So the thing is, well, they found that, you know, patients, you know, may use the high THC compared to the CBD ratio to sleep. And they could use the lower or the mid-level, you know, the equal, more for during the day. Yes, somebody had a question. Right, the thing is, well, part of it's true. The, the thing is that there's only THC in Marinol, and the, that's probably why it doesn't work well for pain, because you really, the evidence is that the CBD works for pain, and it works even, because THC does have some analgesic effect, but it's better to have both the CBD and the THC together, and Marinol doesn't have that. So the combination works a lot better. Is that, does that answer your question? Actually, the prescription of Marinol is for weight loss and, and I read uh, nausea for like nausea. And, and, and for like chemotherapy induced nausea. That's what it's used for. But we've had patients say, "Oh, can I use that for pain?" Well, you know, it's there's very little evidence that it works for pain, and it may be based on the fact of it doesn't have a CBD component. I've, we've t I've tried it on a number of patients and without much benefit. Yeah, benefit. And then I couldn't get them off the Marinol. They liked it right, for right, whatever right. reason. So. <laughs> Uh, I've had a similar experience with a handful of patients from New Jersey who are, uh, you know, now spending two or three hundred dollars. Uh, also, it's uh, the cannabis is a cash business, oh, every place, and it's a uh, it's not covered by insurance, of course. Right, as I'm um, saying, and and it's it's what what's been stated now is that right now the dispensaries aren't doing that well. And now again, I'm not I don't own a dispensary. I don't know. I can't give you a definitive answer, but they're not. A lot of docs or clinicians are not 
Um, the, the, even this, we've been told this, that the, 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 the doc, there are not, not many docs that are signing up to do it. And a lot of it is fear because, uh, one of it's lack of education on it, but two is the fear because this is an illegal drug. What's my risk as a clinician if something happens? Um, I'll give you a, a great example. I was giving this lecture in North Carolina, or South Carolina, I'm trying to remember. South Carolina. And I was talking to 99% of them were clinicians. And someone said to me, what if um, they get into a, someone gets into a car accident and kills a six-year-old girl, and they find that they were using medical cannabis? So I, you know, I said, well, you know, so you go through this talk about, well, you know, there are risks. You've got to make sure patients are aware of the risk. Just like any other drug, there are risks. The person, I don't know if this person was a setup because the person behind came up to speak and said, I want to let you know I had a case of a six-year-old girl who was killed and I was the doc against the physician and I, against him for even recommending cannabis because he was responsible for killing that six-year-old girl. So there, there, you know I mean? So the thing is, it, that's why I think there's still clinicians out there that are afraid because it is a Schedule I drug. They've been telling us, generally, that there should not be fear on our end because there's enough evidence out there. People are writing it. There'll be enough people to defend you if something happens because there are people prescribing or recommending it. But there aren't enough. There, this is, there's still an issue where you know, docs want to see studies. You know, how, if you can't study it, it's been studied in other countries, and a lot of times docs are always hesitant. Well, it's done in China, I don't believe, you know, it's done in, uh, you know, Yugoslavia, or is it done in, uh, you know, it's not done in the United States. I want to see where is it done in the United States. And there are studies out there, but they're limited. There's a doc in California, uh, anesthesiologist, who's been studying for about 20 years and has great evidence. But he's, you know, I mean, there's not that many, and that's the problem. So there is a risk, and that's why I think the, the insurance companies obviously are not paying for it, and it can be potentially expensive for patients. They may be able to pay it for a few months, and then after a while, they, they you know, so it is a potential problem in that regard. Yeah. Is the uh, va vapor, vapor, vapor uh, yeah. became available in New York State? And I had one, I talked to you about it before, one particular patient that went. For, for lack of a better term, bonkers on it, right. uh, attacked his wife and was hospitalized psychiatrically a few times. Uh, now he's fine off of it. How's the but, wife? Uh, the wife was fine. Okay. Uh, the individual had no, no prior psychiatric history and uh, seemed to be uh, not sure what the issue was. Is, that, is the, is the uh, vaporized marijuana that's being used in the vapor cigarettes the same as the yeah, it's a, it's general a, street it, use of vapor? No, street use is primarily THC alone. So the mm -hmm. vape is THC with CBD, mm -hmm. and it's a lower ratio. So no, it shouldn't. It's it's not the same, and that's why you know people get confused. It's not the same. It's the, what you're getting in the first of all. You don't even know what you're getting. You know, my best friend got me this best product. You don't know what's in that product. You know, fentanyl could be laced in there and all this other stuff. But with medical cannabis, it's 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 a ratio, and you're really using a lower end of the amount of THC. Mm -hmm. as well. So there's less, obviously a lot less risk. But again, here's a case where someone's using it and something happens. So as a clinician, you really want, and we have that in our office too, a lot, of, you want to have a lot of information provided to the patient that they're aware of what they're getting involved in and to have close follow-up with these patients. Yeah. You always find that, right? You talk about something and now... I'm sorry. No, it's good, good. I'm a pathologist and I have two clients that have seizures that right. take um, the medical marijuana for their seizures. And um, we have a neighboring state that they go to for um, their neurologist. Right. And um, he recommends the medical marijuana for them. So obviously in our state, they don't, Can't. They don't have it with a neighboring state. Right. And, so, and the problem comes up is crossing the state. Right. I'm, oh, good. I guess what I'm trying to do is kind of understand and figure that whole thing out because I just don't ask questions. I, I go into the home to provide services, and I don't ask questions how much they take. I know that they get their um, product from Helmet Army, so I know that it's got the, the stuff that the THC removes. 
Um, so it's pure CBD, which that's been used, yes, right? Yes. It's been used, CBD, right? Primarily, not THC, you say? Right. Well, Palmetto Harmony is, is out of South Carolina. It's okay. in Conway, South Carolina. Okay. Where the product's made. So I would assume okay. the stuff that can get you high is, has been taken out because it's in, the company is in South Carolina. It's in Conway, South Carolina. That's, that's okay. the Right. Right. Um, so I'm just a little confused. Can you explain how that, like, how that whole, like, being across the line and, like, from one state to another, how that, how does that work? Like, I've been very confused about well, that. Well, how would, you know. You know, you know, it's again. I'm not. A, I'm not an attorney or a police officer, but the thing is, is that if you cross state lines and you get caught, you're at risk. Um, the thing is that they're pretty. From what I've been told, is that you know they're not getting into this too much in the sense that you know if you have it. But the thing is, is that if it's illegal and you're driving sort of just not correctly and the police officer finds that you have cannabis somewhere in there, then you, you're potentially up for a risk. Yeah, so crossing the line, we, t we have patients that we tell them, and they know this, you know, like I'm, tra I'm traveling to Bermuda. Well, don't travel with it because the airport is federal and federally it's illegal. So you have a problem, you know. So if you, if, you fly to, if you fly to Colorado and buy it as a recreational drug and you fly back to New York and that And get caught in the you, airport, you, it's a federal, you could be at risk. But again, if you really, you know, people have done it though. People have done it. And there's no, no been issue. But again, it is illegal. They have to be aware. We tell our patients, like even going to, you know, if you go to Boston, Boston is legal, Massachusetts, but getting to Boston, there's a state in there that it's not approved. So if you get caught, you're at risk. But again, it's taking a risk. It's risk versus benefit. I have, you a, know. I have a patient, just as an aside, I have a patient who uh, has a, a relative who is using it as a chemotherapy agent mm -hmm. for lung cancer and actually inexplicably has had resolution. Yeah, it has anti-tumor effect. Uh, of tumors and uh, was getting it in the mail Actually, and yeah. he said that the the federal authorities in the mail let this because it's labeled whatever the the company is and it has, has a serendipity something right. or other I don't know but it's all marked labeled they know what it is and they let it through the post they, I think, they let it through the post office yeah I think it you know and, and again you know what it is it's illegal in federally right so you're putting yourself at or they're putting themselves at risk but what's going to ha you know again it's a risk versus benefit what if you get caught, what's going to happen? I don't know. Uh, we only tell them, look, this is what it's, it's. We want to educate them that you could be pulled over and found out that this, and they, and who knows what that police officer is thinking that time, and wants to just, you know, all of a sudden get the, you know, whatever he he's going to pull you over and take it and put you. Uh, who knows? I don't know. Of course, one of the children with seizures vomits after his seizures, and so the um, the center is always like, and they walking away from you when he vomits. Oh God! <laughs> Great. But luckily, my um, spouse is in law enforcement, so then that helps. That yeah. Happens. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> okay. Yes. No, you had a question. Yeah. It takes calling your, you know, we're, we're up in Albany every, once or twice a year. Um, we, you do have a voice, and I'll give you an example of it. We went up to Albany last year. We talked to a, a, a gentleman, Gottfried, who is very much pro-medical cannabis. Um, and uh, we talked to a couple other assemblymen up there. And they were very much interested in what we had to say as a society. And, the, and it still wasn't approved for chronic pain. Then, a, you know, we had one of our speakers was from Albany, and she's part of this whole group. And she has spoken two or three times now with us. And she had, or this group, called us 
uh, probably in Jan I don't remember the exact month, but maybe January or February of, two th of you know this past year, and um, all of, and they asked us, can you please help us to just what would be the best way to present using cannabis for chronic pain? We were on the phone for about an hour. A month later, it was approved for chronic pain. Now, I can't say it was us, but boy, they actually asked us for our opinion, and a month later, it got approved. Now, it may have been getting approved anyway. I don't want to put all, the, all on us, but it shows that you have a voice. So if you can go up to Albany and say, look, this is something as a whole, you know, you have the whole um, Arnold Chiari malformation group and you go up there and speak for the group and say, look, we need this. We want to get this approved. We want it to be a Schedule II drug, not a Schedule I. You know, again, it's a matter of just keep pushing. They're on the brink of, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're but again, we don't know. Every, every six months we go, ah, you know, we're motivated, and then it's sort of like we're not so sure. So it's a matter of you got to just keep pushing. And chronic pain, we were, sh we were sure it was not going to be approved for a while because the whole opioid epidemic, or I shouldn't say epidemic, opioid crisis, now they're going to accept cannabis? They did, so for chronic pain. So you do have a voice, and I think that's what you have to do. You have to go up to Albany and, and you know, as a whole group and say, we're going up there. We want to have a say. We want to meet some of the people, and they'll be willing to listen to you. I heard some people suggest that once you know, more than 50% of the states legalize it uh, for medical use, at least uh, feds will kind yeah, of they'll start. They'll I mean, start it uh, all depends on who, you know, again, who's in the White House, who's in the, who's the Attorney General. You know, this is another issue, too. Yeah? Um, in New York State, today, or specifically Long Island, are there dispensaries of patient with the hoops? Oh, the, the hoops? Have you all jumped through the hoops and got the hoops? Is there dispensaries locally in Long Island? Yes. Huh? No, there, there's... Um, there's one in Queens, I think, and one, one in Riverhead. In Riverhead, Queens, White, White Plains. There's two. There's actually one in Nassau County. There's one in Riverhead. There's one in. Um, there's a total. I think. I'm, I don't quote me on the number, but I think almost up to 19, in the state. So, but you. Have, but you have definitely. Uh, I may be incorrect on the exact number, but you have a few in the, uh, on Long Island. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they were actually contemplating mailing it. Huh. If you had a card and right, you need to have the card. Yeah. That they would send it to you in the mail because if you are sick, it's you can't get there. Right. You can't get there, and plus. Well, they also will have too that you can have a provider, meaning that somebody who's health yeah. provider, who's who's there with you know the with the patient. Okay. Well, I think we'll close thank off this session. Thank you very session. much. I just uh, want to thank. Dr. Duarte for two excellent talks.